Section 31 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 41. Louis XIII, Cardinal Richelieu, and Foreign Affairs. Part 2. The king had put himself in motion to join his army. Quote, the French noblesse, said Spinola, are very fortunate in seeing themselves honoured by the presence of the king their master amongst their armies. I have nothing to regret in my life but never to have seen the like on the part of mine. This great general had resumed the siege of Casal when Louis the Thirteenth entered Savoy. The inhabitants of Chambery opened their gates to him. Annecy and Montmelian succumbed after a few days' siege. Maurienne in its entirety made its submission, and the king fixed his quarters there, whilst the cardinal pushed forward to Casal with the main body of the army. Rejoicings were still going on for a success gained before Veillenne over the troops of the Duke of Savoy, when news arrived of the capture of Mantua by the imperialists. This was the finishing blow to the ambitious and restless spirit of the Duke of Savoy. He saw Mantua in the hands of the Spaniards, quote, who never give back aught of what falls into their power, whatever justice and the interests of alliance may make binding on them. End quote. It was all hope lost of an exchange which might have given him back Savoy. He took to his bed and died on the twenty sixth of July, sixteen thirty, telling his son that peace must be made on any terms whatever. Quote, By just punishment of God, he, who during forty or fifty years of his reign had constantly tried to set his neighbours ablaze, died amidst the flames of his own dominions, which he had lost by his own obstinacy against the advice of his friends and his allies. The King of France, in ill health, had just set out for Lyon, and thither the cardinal was soon summoned, for Louis the Thirteenth appeared to be dying. When he reached convalescence, the truce suspending hostilities since the death of the Duke of Savoy was about to expire. Marshal Schomberg was preparing to march on the enemy when there was brought to him a treaty, signed at Ratisbonne, between the Emperor and the Ambassador of France, assisted by Francis du Tremblay, now known as Father Joseph, perhaps the only friend and certainly the most intimate confidant of the Cardinal, who always employed him on delicate or secret business. But Marshal Schomberg was fighting against Spain. He did not allow himself to be stopped by a treaty concluded with the Emperor, and speedily found himself in front of Casal. The two armies were already face to face, when there was seen coming out of the entrenchments an officer in the Pope's service, who waved a white handkerchief. He came up to Marshal Schomberg, and was recognized as Captain Giulio Mazzarini, often employed on the Nuncio's affairs. He brought word that the Spaniards would consent to leave the city, if at the same time the French would evacuate the citadel. Spinola was no longer there to make a good stand before the place. He had died a month previously, complaining loudly that his honour had been filched from him, and determined not to yield up his last breath in a town which would have to be abandoned, he had caused himself to be removed out of Casal to go and die in a neighbouring castle. Casal evacuated. The cardinal broke out violently against the negotiators of Ratisbon, saying that they had exceeded their powers, and declaring that the king regarded the treaty as null and void. There was, accordingly, a recommencement of negotiations with the Emperor as well as the Spaniards. It was only in the month of September, 1631, that the states of Savoy and Mantua were finally evacuated by the hostile troops. Pignerol had been given up to the new Duke of Savoy, but a secret agreement had been entered into between that prince and France. French soldiers remained concealed in Pignerol, and they retook possession of the place in the name of the king, who had purchased the town and its territory to secure himself a passage into Italy. The Spaniards, when they had news of it, made so much the more uproar as they had the less foreseen it, and as it cut the thread of all the enterprises they were meditating against Christendom. The affairs of the emperor in Germany were in too bad a state for him to rekindle war, and France kept Pignerol. The House of Austria, in fact, was threatened mortally. For two years Cardinal Richelieu had been laboring to carry war into its very heart. Ferdinand II had displeased many electors of the empire, who began to be disquieted at the advances made by his power. Quote, it is no doubt a great affliction for the Christian commonwealth, said the cardinal to the German princes, that none but the Protestants should dare to oppose such pernicious designs. They must not be aided in their enterprises against religion, but they must be made use of in order to maintain Germany in the enjoyment of her liberties. The Catholic League in Germany 
habitually allied as it was with the house of austria did not offer any leader to take the field against her the king of denmark after a long period of hostilities had just made peace with the emperor and quote, in their need all these offended and despoiled princes looked as sailors look to the north end quote, towards the king of sweden gustavus adolphus quote, the king of sweden was a new rising sun who having been at war with all his neighbors had wrested from them several provinces he was young but of great reputation and already incensed against the emperor not so much on account of any real injuries he had received from him as because he was his neighbor his majesty had kept an eye upon him with a view of attempting to make use of him in order to draw off in course of time the main body of the emperor's forces and give him work to do in his own dominions memoire de richelieu page one nineteen through Richelieu's good offices, Gustavus Adolphus had just concluded a long truce with the Poles, with whom he had been for some time at war. The cardinal's envoy, M. de Charnas, at once made certain propositions to the King of Sweden, promising the aid of France if he would take up the cause of the German princes. But Gustavus turned a cold ear to these overtures, quote, not seeing in any quarter any great encouragement to undertake the war, either in England, peace with the Spaniards being there as good as determined upon, or in Holland, for the same reason, or in the Hanseatic towns, which were all exhausted of wealth, or in Denmark, which had lost heart and was daily disarming, or in France, whence he got no word on which he could place certain reliance. The emperor, on his side, was seeking to make peace with Sweden, quote, and the people of that country were not disinclined to listen to him. End quote. God, for the accomplishment of his will, sets at naught the designs and intentions of men. Gustavus Adolphus was the instrument chosen by Providence to finish the work of Henry IV and Richelieu. Negotiations continued to be carried on between the two parties, but before his alliance with France was concluded, the King of Spain, taking a sudden resolution, set out for Germany on the 30th of May, 1630, with 15,000 men, quote, having told Charnas that he would not continue the war beyond that year if he did not agree upon terms of treaty with the King. So much does passion blind us, adds the cardinal, that he thought it to be in his power to put an end to so great a war as that, just as it had been in his power to commence it. By this time Gustavus Adolphus was in Pomerania, the duke whereof, maltreated by the emperor, admitted him on the 10th of July into Stettin, after a show of resistance. The imperialists, in their fury, put to a cruel death all the inhabitants of the said city who happened to be in their hands, and gave up all its territory to fire and sword. Quote, the king of Sweden, on the contrary, had his army in such discipline that it seemed as if every one of them were living at home, and not amongst strangers, for in the actions of this king there was nothing to be seen but inexorable severity towards the smallest excesses on the part of his men, extraordinary gentleness towards the populations, and strict justice on every occasion, all which conciliated the affections of all, and so much the more in that the emperor's army, unruly, insolent, disobedient to its leaders, and full of outrage against the people, made their enemies' virtues shine forth the brighter." Memoire de Richelieu, page 419. Gustavus Adolphus had left Sweden under the impulse of love for those glorious enterprises which make great generals, but still more of a desire to maintain the Protestant cause which he regarded as that of God. He had assembled the estates of Sweden in the castle of Stockholm, presenting to them his daughter Christina, four years old, whom he confided to their faithful care. Quote, I have hopes, he said to them, of ending by bringing triumph to the cause of the oppressed. But as the pitcher that goes often to the well gets broken, so I fear it may be my fate. I, who have exposed my life amidst so many dangers, who have so often spilt my blood for the country, without thanks to God having been wounded to death, must in the end make a sacrifice of myself. For that reason I bid you farewell, hoping to see you again in a better world. End quote he continued advancing into Germany. Quote, this snow-king will go on melting as he comes south, said the emperor Ferdinand, on hearing that Gustavus Adolphus had disembarked. But Mecklenburg was already in his hands, and the elector of Brandenburg had just declared in his favor. He everywhere made proclamation, quote, that the inhabitants were to come forward and join him to take the part of their princes, whom he was coming to replace in possession. End quote he was investing all parts of austria whose hereditary dominions he had not yet attacked it was in the name of the empire that he fought against the emperor the diet was terminating at ratisbon and it had just struck a fatal blow at the imperial cause the electors catholic and protestant 
jealous of the power as well as of the glory of the celebrated Wallenstein, creator and commander-in-chief of the emperor's army, who had made him Duke of Friedland, and endowed him with the duchies of Mecklenburg, had obliged Ferdinand II to withdraw from him the command of the forces. At this price he had hoped to obtain their votes to designate his son King of the Romans. The first step towards hereditary empire had failed, thanks to the ability of Father Joseph. Quote, this poor Capuchin has disarmed me with his chaplet, said the emperor, and for all that his cowl is so narrow he has managed to get six electoral hats into it. The treaty he had concluded, disavowed by France, did not for an instant hinder the progress of the king of Sweden, and the cardinal lost no time in letting him know that quote, the king's intention was in no wise to abandon him, but to assist him more than ever, insomuch as he deemed it absolutely necessary in order to thwart the designs of those who had no end in view but their own augmentation, to the prejudice of all the other princes of Europe. End quote. On the twenty fifth of January, sixteen thirty one, at Bernwald, the treaty of alliance between France and Sweden was finally signed. Baron Charnas had inserted in the draft of the treaty the term protection as between France and Gustavus Adolphus. Quote, Our master asks for no protection but that of heaven, said the Swedish plenipotentiaries. After God, his majesty holds himself indebted only to his sword and his wisdom for any advantages he may gain. End quote. Charnas did not insist, and the victories of Gustavus Adolphus were an answer to any difficulties. The King of Spain bound himself to furnish soldiers, thirty thousand men at the least. France was to pay, by way of subsidy, four hundred thousand crowns a year, and to give a hundred thousand crowns to cover past expenses. Gustavus Adolphus promised to maintain the existing religion in such countries as he might conquer, quote, though he said, laughingly, that there was no possibility of promising about that, except in the fashion of him who sold the bear's skin, end quote. He likewise guaranteed neutrality to the princes of the Catholic League, provided that they observed it towards him. The treaty was made public at once, through the exertions of Gustavus Adolphus, though Cardinal Richelieu had charged Charnas to keep it secret for a time. Torquato Conti, one of the Emperor's generals, who had taken Wallenstein's place, wished to break off warfare during the long frosts. Quote, My men do not recognize winter answered Gustavus Adolphus, quote, this prince, who did not take to war as a pastime, but made it in order to conquer, end quote, marched with great strides across Germany, reducing everything as he went. He had arrived by the end of April before Frankfurt on the Oder, which he took, and he was preparing to succor Magdeburg, which had early pronounced for him, and which Tilly, the emperor's general, kept besieged. The elector of Saxony hesitated to take sides. He refused Gustavus Adolphus a passage over the bridge of Dessau on the Elbe. On the 20th of May, Magdeburg fell, and Tilly gave over the place to the soldiery. Thirty thousand persons were massacred, and the houses committed to the flames. Quote, Nothing like it has been seen since the taking of Troy and of Jerusalem, said Tilly in his savage joy. The Protestant princes, who had just been reconstituting the Evangelical Union, in the diet they had held in February at Leipzig, revolted openly, ordering levies of soldiers to protect their territories. The Catholic League, renouncing neutrality, flew to arms on their side. The question became nothing less than that of restoring to the Protestants all that had been granted them by the Peace of Passau. The soldiery of Tilly were already let loose on electoral Saxony. The elector, constrained by necessity, entrusted his soldiers to Gustavus Adolphus, who had just received reinforcements from Sweden, and the king marched against Tilly, still encamped before Leipzig, which he had forced to capitulate. The Saxons gave way at the first shock of the imperial troops, but the king of Sweden had dashed forward, and nothing could withstand him. Tilly himself, hitherto proof against lead and steel, fell wounded in three places. Five thousand dead were left on the field of battle, and Gustavus Adolphus dragged at his heels seven thousand prisoners. Quote, Never did the grace of God pull me out of so bad a scrape, said the conqueror. He halted some time at Mayence, which had just opened its gates to him. Axel Oxenstiern, his most faithful servant and oldest friend, whose intimacy with his royal master reminds one of that between Henry the Fourth and Sully, came to join him in Germany. He had hitherto been commissioned to hold the government of the conquests won from the Poles. He did not approve of the tactics of Gustavus Adolphus, who was attacking the Catholic League, and meanwhile leaving to the elector of Saxony the charge of carrying the war into the hereditary dominions of Austria. Quote, Sir, said he, I should have liked to offer you my felicitations on your victories, not at Mayence, but at Vienna. End quote. 
quote, if after the battle of leipzig the king of sweden had gone straight to attack the emperor in his hereditary provinces it had been all over with the house of austria says cardinal richelieu but either god did not will the certain destruction of that house which would perhaps have been too prejudicial to the catholic religion and he turned him aside from the council which would have been more advantageous for him to take or the same god who giveth not all to any but distributeth his gifts diversely to each had given to this king as to hannibal the knowledge how to conquer, but not how to use victory. End quote. Gustavus Adolphus had resumed his course of success. He came up with Tilly again on the leak, April 10, 1632, and crushed his army. The general was mortally wounded, entering Augsburg in triumph, proclaimed religious liberty there. He had moved forward in front of Ingolstadt, and was making a reconnaissance in person. Quote, a king is not worthy of his crown who makes any difficulty about carrying it wherever a simple soldier can go, he said. A cannonball carried off the hind quarters of his horse and threw him down. He picked himself up all covered with blood and mud. Quote, the fruit is not yet ripe, he cried, with that strange mixture of courage and fatalism which so often characterizes great warriors. And he marched to Munich, on which he imposed a heavy war contribution the elector of bavaria strongly favored by france sought to treat in the name of the catholic league but gustavus adolphus required complete restitution of all territories wrested from the protestant princes the withdrawal of the troops occupying the dominions of the evangelicals and the absolute neutrality of the catholic princes Quote, these conditions smacked rather of your victorious prince who would lay down and not accept the law End quote. He summoned to him all the inhabitants of the countries he traversed in conqueror's style. Quote, Surgiti di mortuis, he said to the Bavarians, et venite ad judium, end quote, or rise from the dead and come to judgment. Protestant Swabia had declared for him, and Duke Bernard of Saxe Weimar, one of his ablest lieutenants, carried the Swedish arms to the very banks of the Lake of Constance. The Lutheran countries of Upper Austria had taken up arms, and Switzerland had permitted the King of Sweden to recruit on her territory. Quote, Italy began to tremble, says Cardinal Richelieu. The Genovese themselves were fortifying their town, and to see them doing so, it seemed as if the King of Sweden were at their gates, but God had disposed it otherwise. End quote. The Emperor Ferdinand had recalled the only general capable of making a stand against Gustavus Adolphus. Wallenstein, deeply offended, had for a long while held out, but being assured of the supreme command over the fresh army which Ferdinand was raising in all directions, he took the field at the end of April, 1632. Wallenstein effected a junction with the elector of Bavaria, forcing Gustavus Adolphus back, little by little, on Nuremberg. Quote, I mean to show the King of Sweden a new way of making war, said the German general. The sufferings of his army in an entrenched camp soon became intolerable to Gustavus Adolphus. In spite of inferiority of forces, he attacked the enemy's redoubts, and was repulsed. The king revictualled Nuremberg, and fell back upon Bavaria. Wallenstein at first followed him, and then flung himself upon Saxony, and took Leipzig. Gustavus Adolphus advanced to succor his ally, and the two armies met near the little town of Lutzen on the 16th of November, 1632. There was a thick fog. Gustavus Adolphus, rising before daybreak, would not put on his breastplate, his old wounds hurting him under harness. Quote, God is my breastplate, he said. When somebody came and asked him for the watchword, he answered, quote, God is with us. End quote. And it was Luther's hymn, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, or Our God is a strong tower, that the Swedes sang as they advanced towards the enemy. The king had given orders to march straight on Lutzen. Quote, he animated his men to the fight, says Richelieu, with words that he had at command, whilst Wallenstein, by his mere presence and the sternness of his silence, seemed to let his men understand that, as he had been wont to do, he would reward them or chastise them according as they did well or ill on that great day. End, quote. End of section 31